Professor Reed teaches international business at the Queen's School of Business in the undergraduate program. In the past, he's taught in the Cornell Queen's Accelerated MBA, Executive MBA, and the full-time Queen's MBA programs. As a researcher, Professor Reed originally focused on intercompany alliance dynamics and large alliance evolution. His current projects include two books, one on the management of analytics and the other on the risk and opportunities for measurement in organizations. In 2005, Professor Reed was appointed as Distinguished Faculty Teaching Fellow at QSB. Prior to entering the academic world, Professor Reed was Vice President of an international consulting firm handling corporate issues management. He also worked for a former Premier of Ontario as a Chief of Staff to a Provincial Cabinet Minister. And in 1990, Professor Reed founded a consulting company, which is still active, whose clients were drawn primarily from Canada's technology industries. Professor Reed served as a corporate director on two private sector boards and on one public agency board. He earned the ICD.D designation for the Institute of Corporate Directors. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Douglas Reed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is everybody, am I coming through loud and clear? Sweet. Um, <clears throat> sorry if my voice is a little um, quirky. I, I was teaching in this room all day this morning and left at lunch to go and give a presentation at the business school. So you're three of the day. <laughs> um, but the good news is when I'm finished today, after a quick chat with my friends from uh, Alumni and Volunteer Services, I'm going to a hardware store. So the day is now going to be complete. Uh, first of all, I'm really happy to be here for a couple of reasons, and I, I, I won't bore you with them, but I will, I'd like to start with something that I think is important that you hear, um, which I don't know if you hear a lot, but let me say it anyway, and that is thank you. Um, I'm a grad, uh, MPA 96, and I am not very active. And it's not that I don't want to, it's simply I don't remember to. And life can be busy, as you probably know. Now, I've done a little bit of work with friends. I see Peter in the room and uh, brings back some very interesting times at the Transac in Toronto. I hadn't quite thought of those stories for a while. I did, honestly didn't intend to talk about them today. Um, <laughs> no, just as well. It's just as well. But um, I just want to say thank you because a lot of what I remember of my time here is the people, and a lot of what I care about are the values. And somehow that has to be kept alive because there are days when I come to work and I get my head goes crazy because it is a university after all. So some things are always going to be difficult. Um, but I want to say thank you because it's, it's hard in this age of being busy and obsessed with all of the things that you can count to realize that putting some life back into the memories you had are actually something you can't count, but something which matters hugely. So thank you. Let me just start with that. Second thing is I really would like this to be not a monologue um, because you'll get bored fast. The second reason is that you're at that point in the day where you actually want to sleep. <laughs> Nodding heads is good. Because you've eaten. And notwithstanding the fact you had an amazingly interesting AGM and a fascinating fit break, which I went through this morning and I'm still recovering. Um, <laughs> your body is saying, we must have a nap right now. I need you to bear with me, but I promise I'll try to give you something that's interesting. So let me do this. I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about a subject that to me can be a difference maker and I want to offer it in the hope that it is of use to you when you think about what you're doing with our alumni association, which I include myself. And I've called it runs long, long, runs long and Short. And uh, I, I did that for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is it is a bit of a riff on um, a fairly good book by a gentleman named Dan Kahneman. I don't know if anybody's read this, but if you haven't, I would encourage you to do so. Dan Kahneman is um, a Nobel Prize winner, and he wrote a book about thinking. And for a psychologist who won an economics Nobel, it's an incredibly humble book because what it really gets to is how little he knows even after a lifetime's work. But what he really gets to and what he really says that is powerful is that in our heads there's two systems of coping. The fast system, which is 
Uh, it's got some tremendous advantages to it, but the one that seems to be lingering in the background but is vital is this slower system. And more and more, in a world where speed seems to be the only currency, there's something about recognizing the wisdom of slow that's impactful. In fact, the group that was here this morning were people who were executive directors of social service agencies in, Toronto, in, in the province of Ontario. And one of the things they mentioned and came up often was the dilemma they faced in trying to get so much done and to keep abreast of techniques. And it only took us a while to get to an idea, which was what would happen if you stopped and let your experience catch up with you? What happens if you gave up the idea of keeping up with technique and instead realize you actually have everything you need to do well right now? Why not just take a moment? And this was for them somewhat powerful. I wish I could say it was my idea, but the idea was that maybe, just maybe, we're not getting anywhere by trying to do the next new thing. Maybe we already have what we need. We just have to let it find us again. So I commend this to you, but it's nice to be able to riff on this. Let me also, in the spirit of um, modesty, uh, promise not very much. <laughs> I would like to downsize expectations. Downsize, by the way, is the wrong word to use at a university. I would like to reduce your expectations <laughs> because um, that would be wise. And the reason I'd like to do that is there are no miracles to anything. Everything is trade-off and tenacity. So all I'm going to do today is really, I'm going to give you a little bit of, of stuff about, maybe think of it as a proposition or maybe even a constructive provocation. What does the present owe to the future? What do you owe to the future of the Alumni Association or the Alumni Organization and Infrastructure? And if we get to it, I want to give you an idea or two about planning, how you might look at it, that includes this idea. What do I mean when I say if we get to it? Because unique among many of my colleagues, I'm not that interested in getting through this whole deck of slides. It is far more important that we have a conversation and far more important that we talk about things that are important to you. You can read the slides. You will be getting them later on. The fact you don't have them now is uh, at my request. I usually prefer people not do that because uh, we all know we go to the end of the slide and say, okay, there's 36 slides. That's interesting. How's he doing? Oh, look at the clock. Oh. <laughs> not so good. Do you think he's going to make it? I don't know. He's going to have to speed up. A lot of pictures. Oh, yeah, but, you know, they can talk about pictures. So <laughs> what I'm trying to get across is... You'll get everything anyway, and I Creative Commons license everything, so you can, if this is of use to you, please use it, don't even ask, just go ahead. Because it's important we get ideas moving around. But this is about what I want to deliver to you today, if you're okay with that. Now, I want to begin with a bit of a question, and uh, because I'm a business school prof, I've got to bring in at least one business school example, uh, or a business example, here it is. And this is it. Remember that logo? Kodak. Does anybody want to, does anybody, when you think of Kodak, what comes to your mind, just off the top of your head, what comes to mind right away for anybody here? I can't, sorry, that's so much participation. I, <laughs> I'm not used to that. I need, I need order. Help me out. Film? Okay. What else is coming out? Cameras? What else is coming out? Moments. What's that? interesting? What else? Yeah. The Kodak moment. The Kodak moment, which was what? Yeah. Everything important should have Kodak attached to it. If you're going to take a picture, it's a Kodak moment. Wasn't that brilliant? Yes. What else? Anything coming up for anybody else? Just ideas. What's showing up? Don't think, just emote. Memory. Memory. Memory is good. That's the real function of Kodak, by the way, was to, was to deal with the fact that we can't remember detail. What else is coming up, if anything? Well, family. family. Yeah. Kodak moment, family moment, times that matter. Where are they now? Obsolete. Yeah. They're a memory of themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Graduate student, successor. <laughs> we were on a committee together, and I was always amazed at his wit, and it has not diminished. It's so good to see you here. Um, we're still struggling on the committee for what it's worth. Yeah. <laughs> Where are they now? And, and, that, and you got it right. See, this is the question that dogs me. What were they thinking? What were they thinking? I mean, how does a company that essentially is this iconic and this powerful for so long now 
just the punchline for a joke. I mean, that's really quite something. You don't see this too often. But it raises a lot of questions that are relevant to us, and, and in the spirit of being honest, I think it's important we think of them, you think of them, because you have your hand on the rudder, so to speak, of the Illini Association. And I'm going to make a suggestion or two about, well, actually, you know, do me a favor. I'm going to need, I remember I said before, uh, this is not about monologues, so here's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask you to do two things. Um, the first one is, um, I would like you to stand up. Could you ever do that just for a second? I know it's going to totally screw your camera up, but dude, it's worth it. <laughs> Okay, so here's what I want you to do. If you're comfortable standing, that's great. If not, don't worry. Person or persons next to you, here's what I want you to talk about. How did these guys get it so wrong, and why now are they simply a bad joke? They're just a place where we store patents. How did they lose all of that advantage? Talk for about two or three minutes. Feel free to sit down if you want, but at least get the conversation started. Over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's um, reconvene. What came up for you? How, you, know, you don't have to know the detailed history of Kodak. All you need to know is they were once iconic. Now they're not doing so well. Something's happened. What has that been? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Let's just talk about it quickly. Yeah. They didn't evolve or adapt. To what? To, I guess, the changing landscape of photography. Okay. So the reality was moving in this direction, and they were just wherever they were, and they were happy with it. Okay, nice. Thank you. I was going to say they didn't become multi-purpose. Tell me more. Well, we use, like, for example, everyone uses their cell phone to take photos, but taking photos is sort of a secondary function of the phone. So the fact that they were so singular in okay. the product they produce, I think, would be that. Yeah. Yeah. So another, way, another thing I think of what I'm hearing you say is the user change, they didn't. Okay, neat. Anybody over here? Yeah. You said pride before. A little louder if you don't mind. Pride before the fall. Interesting argument that's been made about them is that they were based in a little city called Rochester, New York. Um, no diss on Rochester. I had no experience with it at all. But it's a little insular. It's a little off the beaten path. It's a little away from the big city. Sound familiar? <laughs> Here's the point. No, hang on a second. Their big competitor at the same time was a company called Fujifilm. They're about the same size, about 30 years ago. Fujifilm is still around, and they're doing multiple things. Kodak, essentially just slightly out of receivership. Let's keep going. What else has came up for you? Yes? I was theorizing maybe what, uh, Kodak was too heavily invested. <laughs> Hi, George. Um, <laughs> too, too heavily invested in one technology and unable to be nimble enough to change over. So I, the, the analogy I had is like maybe Ford is making cars, but then tomorrow they're asked to make trains and planes too far a leap for them because right. they're too stuck in cars. So in other words, the moment you're hinged on the product, you forget the outcome. Mm -hmm. The outcome is transportation, but maybe it's not quite this. Yeah. Got it. Uh, yes, sir? There's an interesting parallel there in Rochester with Xerox and Kodak. Yes, Kodak absolutely. Were headquarters were on the streets from each other. And Kodak didn't make that transition. Xerox did, having come to the edge of the abyss. Yes. And pulled themselves back successfully. Yes. Xerox is interesting because it did a lot of things, including partnering outside of, outside of the US in order to get there. Very good. Anyone else come up with it? Again, it's just see the patterns here. Anyone else see a thing? Yeah. I think the one thing that we discussed was the whole ability to be cannibalized your existing focus area. And it's very difficult for a large company, a singular kind of investment strategy, to, to cannibalize it. It's usually a competitor that has to come in to change the state. Absolutely. And, and the hard part is to admit that there may be a deficiency that you should move to eliminate first before someone outside does. Anybody else see anything? Nicely done, by the way. That was, uh, wow, you should come back. <laughs> I can recommend some really good MBA programs, but it sounds like you all have them. Um, the reason I raise this is the what they were thinking is the problem. We, it's easy to sit back and say they could have been different, they could have been better. But what we can say with confidence is they didn't get here exclusively because of bad luck. They got here because of choices. The question is, what were the thinking problems that got them here in the spirit of thinking fast and slow, runs long and short? So you can critique Kodak for being in Rochester, and you can talk about Rochester's isolation from 
New York City or mainstream US or even you know, difference at all. But that may not be the point. Maybe there's a couple of other things that are going on that we need to think about or could think about that might make some sense. Let me try a couple, of, uh, a couple of them on you just for reaction. It's well known that there is a strong present moment bias in our thinking. It's really quite well known that while we do have the ability to imagine the future, a lot of our attention is, is around the gratification that comes with doing something where you can see results now. So in the case of Kodak, if you're the person having to come in and say, look, I got a little, I've got this crazy idea. This internet thing, you know, just, I'm trying this out here. What if, and you can see where this goes, we need to invest money in this. We need to think about what we, what we do if this ever becomes popular. And that gets in the way of dealing with whatever is going on in the moment, which might be pushing film in Minnesota. Strong present moment bias in thinking can get in the way of seeing what's coming. Second one, and I think this is, this is highly relevant, is a lot of what we do and a lot of the effects we have in terms of how we make a difference, whether we're uh, running a company or whether we're doing as you're doing, being the, you know, the backbone of uh, a group of people who share something, it's where you give your attention. You see, it's interesting. You probably, maybe you've been to these, uh, maybe you haven't, but you've ever heard of time management. Anybody hear of time management courses? Yeah, they don't work. <laughs> part of the reason, no, but part of the reason is if you think about it, you can't manage time. Time ticks along a minute at a time, whether you want it to or not. There's no managing involved. All you can do is decide where you give your attention at each moment. Now, here's the thing. All of us, and I don't care how good you are, how, you know, what uh, faculty you graduate from and how much money you have, all of us have about six hours a day of attention. And that starts about half an hour after we get up. What it means is that, let's say in the four hours you have during your working day, is the time where you're actually going to make all the difference. All the difference. So what you give your attention to is increasingly vital because it is the scarcest resource. Those late afternoon hours, you might think you're on, probably not. But by the way, don't sound like, I've, and believe me, I have not always known this. I wish I had. But the idea is it's what we give those few critical hours to that is determinative. The takeaway idea is we can't do everything. We have to choose. Kodak didn't have enough attention, perhaps, to take a bet on this long shot technology called digital photography and this crazy internet idea. Makes you wonder. The final one that I'm going to suggest to you is that the metaphors we use to talk about our work, our lives, are actually a lot more important than any of us think. Let me give you one that I, tr I, I bump into this a lot in business. Maybe this is something that you've encountered too. It's the metaphor of chess. Anybody here encounter people talking about business as if it was some kind of elaborate chess game? One or two people? Does everybody else have a job? <laughs> okay, good. No, I'm just kidding. I, um, the reason I say this is this metaphor is popular. The other metaphors you'll bump into are sports and war. Now, if you can, I can't think of too many more use, me metaphors that are less useful than those. But let's just stick with chess for a second. The chess metaphor is no longer any use, in my opinion, to anybody trying to think through what it means to be effective competitively in the world today. The biggest reason is that the chessboard has eight by eight squares. Is that the world you see? See, the real world, I think, looks a lot like that. That's more of the story. And instead of having the chess pieces all have powers and capabilities that stay the same, I think the better story of the real world is it changes. Sometimes the pawn gets to go horizontally. Sometimes the knight levitates and flies 
several dozen spaces. And if you find that far-fetched, I encourage you to think of just where prosperity lives in the world these days versus where it did 20, 25 years ago. Point of which is, the metaphor on the left isn't helpful. The metaphor on the right is a little scary. What do we do about this? How do we make sense of all this? So where I want to take you with this is to try to sum it up in one idea. And then I want to give you a challenge or two, if that's OK. And this is not a new idea. I wish I could take credit for it. I can't. I can simply take credit for um, sharing it in the way I am today. And I'm not much of a credit taker. So let's just forget about it and see if the idea serves you. So here's the idea in brief. It goes like this. A lot of the frustration we have in our organizations, whether it's at the university, whether it's in the private sector, whether it's in government or the not-for-profit sector, and whether it's in life, comes down to one fundamental metaphor that pervades everything. And it's this one. This is how we want the world to be. We want it to be like a Swiss watch. Look at that picture for a moment. Isn't that beautiful? Everything machined to within one ten thousandth of, a, of a, an inch precision. Everything perfectly balanced, everything with its assigned role, everything in sequence. And when something goes wrong, the function that what we do, what managers do, is we go into that, we pull it apart, we find the offending piece, and we send it on training. <laughs> or we do we, as best we can to grind it into a perfect circle and plop it back. And when that doesn't work, we throw it away and we get a new piece that hopefully does the same thing, pop it in, and start the watch over again. What a great system. Complex but predictable. Who wouldn't want to have this? Come on in. Have a chair. You're going to stand at the back? OK. Didn't want you to feel that we weren't wanted. Um, complex but predictable. So the question I'm going to ask you is just think of the world you encounter. Is that the world you see? I don't know, but I'll simply suggest that it may not be the best one for the purposes of thinking. I might suggest that there's a different metaphor, and I'm going to commend this to you for what you might think about as you contemplate the stewardship of this organization, or indeed anything else you do in which caring and thinking are involved. And here it is. It's the garden. Now, this is not a metaphor many people like, because it's not about control. So let me just ask you for a moment. Does anybody here garden? OK. People are like, yeah. <laughs> it's not cool, so OK. Be proud. OK, it's all right. Um, so my question to you, but it's the garden. Have you ever had a situation where you put two plants next to each other, like identical type of plant? You've given it the same water and the same sunshine and the same loving care? And then have the plants produce different things, different levels of, of output, you know, whether it's tomatoes or whatever you do. Has anybody had that? So the question is, why is that? And the gardeners all go, oh, well, you know, it's complicated. And as a non-gardener, the best I can say is the things that are going into making that work are more complicated than sun and water and tender loving care. It's, it's a complex system beyond our ability to understand. My suggestion to you is any time you get human beings involved, you have a situation like on the right. You actually can't manage anything with human beings involved to make it look like a Swiss watch. The best any of us can do is garden, which means create the conditions for flourishing, which means a lot less control and a lot more insight and engagement. And that's, oddly enough, I think the source of a lot of frustration. We don't like the way things are because they're not like the Swiss watch. I hear that from business people, not exactly that way, but essentially that way. What's the point of that and why should you care? Well, I want to ask you this question. Maybe this is one you can ponder. How do you create a great garden? Does anybody know? I mean, I don't. I'm not a gardener. Feel free to talk among yourselves for 30 seconds. How do you create a great garden? There's no trick to it. It's not a trick answer because I'm not a gardener. OK, let's reconvene. What have you come up with? What's the suggestion? 
I, I have no magic solution, but any advice? What do you have to do? Yes. We were talking about just planning. Plan, go into it, whereas it's going to be what's going to need, how the plans are going to work together, what you want to do. And does that guarantee a good outcome? Not necessarily, but it will set you oh. up for success. It could set you up for success. Do you have any thoughts on what would help with a good outcome? <laughs> no, like I really don't know. I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I don't know. OK, let's come back to you. Yes. I don't know. Like, don't, I don't know. <laughs> you really have to believe me. I don't garden. I have no idea. Go ahead. I don't know either. Oh, okay. Listen, good talking. Attention might be. Attention. So we're back to what do we do? Okay, we're giving the scarcest thing to it, which is attention. Okay, we're onto something. That's not bad. Yeah. You were talking about the different variables that you can control. So the environment, soil, how much water, how much sun, mm -hmm. um, and which plants we're choosing to oh, okay. plant in. Okay, good. Very scientific, very thoughtful, very reasonable. Good, yeah. We thought we'd divide our next door neighbor's plants because that would be a highly, more highly predictable yes. <laughs> to outsource to an expert. Yeah. <laughs> That's an MBA. Yeah. Uh, yes. You need to give it enough room depending on the type of plant. Beat me. Okay, so in other words, so if you have a garden, <laughs> this is it. Okay, thank you. So if you have a garden, the whole way is you make it bigger. Oh, I can't see. Even for those little tomatoes? Mm -hmm. Even for those yeah, little? Even for the small tomatoes, they okay. need more roots. Wow. Lots of roots. Yeah. Lots of roots. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Also, you can't control everything. You can't control the outcome. Which means what? Meaning, like, some plants are going to maybe go out of control, and pests may come, and how do you can't prevent it all? Like so, flexibility with the outcome, yeah. like, and being able okay. to accept what you get out of it and, and still make something good out of it. Because it's the process that's supposed to be important. You can't guarantee outcomes. Okay, that's a little bit more. I'm liking the sound of that personally. Yes? On the note of the attention, and I'm not a huge gardener, but I just learned all this stuff. Um, you can't water it when it's uh, high heat, so at noon. You can't water them. You have to wait until another hour and then water them. Right. And where do we find out about it? How did we all learn that? Or how did you learn that? I'm uh, some expert at work. Oh, okay, fair enough. That's good. No, it's, it, but it's interesting because you started to realize that the tender, loving care we apply may not turn out to be care the first few times. OK, that's not bad. Anybody else have any thoughts? This is not a trick question. It's intended to get us thinking about complex things like life and organizations. Yeah? We talked about having the right amount of uh, infrastructure in place, whether you have the right type of soil, knowing what type of weather you're dealing with. Sure. Um, How do you find out all that stuff? Mothers. <laughs> the CBC from 12 to 1. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a very good Queen's answer. I like that CBC. That internet thing. That internet thing. Yeah. Protecting against threats. How do you do that? Put a fence around it, or you put stuff on it, or whatever. Shoot the red Keep it away from the <laughs> Bunnies and gear away from it. Here. Okay. Have to fertilizer. fertilizer. Okay. Yes. If you have a greenhouse, can you try and control everything? Beats me. No idea. I don't even have a grow up. I know, I know nothing about it. Yeah. You have to prune back the plants that aren't doing very well. Okay. It's interesting. Over fertilizer. So the main helps the other plants. You are making fewer bets on likelier winners. Okay. That's interesting. Sorry, if they're sick, you have to prune them. Yeah, if it's sick, it's a good thing. You're not with faculty health science, right? No, okay. Yes? I just thought I'd follow up on Jeremy's comment about the greenhouse. Um, with orchids, it's as close as a, to a switch swatch as you'll ever get. It's incredibly scientific. <laughs> How do they taste? How do they taste? How do they taste? I don't eat them. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else? This is not a trick question because I, again, I'm not a gardener. I'm going to tell you what I found out, but everything is contingent. It's a punchline to many, many good setup lines involving one's workplace, isn't it? Yeah. Anybody else? Yes? You have to just sort of have faith that it's all going to work. Uh -huh. Because when it's all in the middle, under the ground, or when it's 
it's all just sitting there. It, it looks as though nothing's ever going to happen, and then there's just that miraculous thing where you see that person, and then you realize actually it's going to work again. Yeah, you look for signs of hope to give you the hope to carry on. Okay. I, again, I have no wisdom in this, so I did a little bit of digging, as one can imagine, on the internet. Oh, sorry, I didn't, that was not intended. I apologize. I really didn't mean that, because it's really so bad. Um, how do you, you do this? You start 10 years ago. Now, what does that mean? What it means is the learning that matters most, the kind that's going to serve you best, is experiential. It's not so much trial and error. It's understanding subtlety at a level of almost not seeing it. You just, don't, you just know it. The hard part is that you have to be prepared to take a view that says, there are going to be times where I'm trying to understand things, and there are going to be times where it's going to be working well. But if I don't recognize the inherent long-run nature of things, I'm going to be frustrated a lot. I'm going to have one of those, it's a good year, bad year things, as opposed to, am I learning, am I learning, am I learning? Am I doing the right thing? The reason I'm going to suggest that is it gets to the heart of planning. As weird as that sounds, I'm going to jump a long way. But the reason I wanted you to start with that is you have to think about the fact that you can't manage anything with the precision you like as long as humans are involved. And that would include an alumni association. So how do you do it? Again, I have no wisdom on that because I don't know. I, I'm not going to tell you how you should do your work better. I don't know how to do your work better. I'm not an expert. You are. I'm going to offer a qu couple of questions I'd like you to think about. The point then of planning for you would be what? Anybody have any thoughts on why you want to bother to plan at all? Since you can't manage it like a Swiss watch, what's the point? Yeah? To make choices. OK. Goals, shared goals and shared priorities amongst people on a team. And then what? Work towards that goal together. Okay. So in other words, target and then F target for effort. Got it. What else? Yeah. I mean, it's like the garden metaphor. It's great. Even if you aren't certain you can succeed, you create the conditions to give you the best chance of success. You can only really okay. do that through yeah. plan. Nice. In other words, you're almost saying to get to the best chance of success, we have to have some point of view about what success looks like and possibly divide labor and how to get there. Anything else? Yeah. Almost in contrast to success and survival, like making sure that if you, if you plan for the conditions around the plan properly, then it won't die. So the, the community won't die. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, to me, that's the Kodak story. That's the part of the story they forgot, which was they kind of thought Kodak was perpetual. Because it always had been. And if you think of it, how, how do many of us envisage the future? Well, we think of it as the present plus 5%. A lot of budgeting gets done that way. But that's the point, is we don't see it as a discontinuous thing. We see it as this kind of flow. Anything else anybody comes up with? The point of planning is to do what? Why do it? Uh, Nate, no trick question, just what do you think? Because you're going to be doing this, I think, I hope. Not today. Yeah? I think it's to understand where you're trying to get to. So what's that forethought? If you don't have the plan and you don't figure out how you're going to get there, that process alone will help you figure out where you're trying to get to. OK, good. So that's something about knowing that you have to do something allows you to explore it and try to find a good way to accomplish it. It's the trial and error part. It's how most of us learn the things that we keep. Great. Uh, yeah? You also aren't able to necessarily look back on your successes and then recognize them. You don't plan and say, you know, we achieve this goal and people um, look at then what's next. So it's really planning for the next step after you reach that, that goal. Yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, what you're really trying to figure out is cause and effect. We did this, that occurred. What happens if you didn't do this and you still got the same outcome? And that's what's the confounding part. It must make gardeners crazy when you think this is going to be a terrible year and you get all of these tomatoes. I think, too, like lifting up your perspective and seeing where you are, where your organization is actually situated in, in its context, like what's, what's changing around you, what's staying the same around you, and how does that, how does that affect where you are right now? Okay. So you're, 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 you're of the let us see reality and deal with what is real school, which I like, by the way. Okay, nice. 
Uh, again, I'm going to offer my perspective. This may, I hope this is of use to you. Here's the reason I think you do this, and there's a, the punchlines at the end. You do it essentially to get an improvement in performance. That's the only reason to do it. How do you get that at a practical level? Well, it's because you create a plan that somehow allows you to make changes. That's kind of obvious. The plan, however, is not that big. But, and this is the important part, the planning is vital. But why is it vital? It's vital because it produces one thing that reason alone can't, prepared minds. The planning process creates people who can think about things that they haven't seen. They can imagine possibilities that they haven't experienced. They're readier to deal with ambiguity and uncertainty because the paralysis that normally hits us when we encounter something that we can't even imagine is gone because we at least imagined it. Now we can think of what we do with it. Planning isn't about getting the plan right. It's about getting the planning right. The prepared minds part is the real payoff because the plan actually won't get accomplished anyway. And that's just fine. <coughs> There's a caveat, which I think comes back to the point made here. Here's the caveat, so long as you remain relevant. And the real story behind Kodak is not bad corporate thinking, bad planning, bad gardening. It's the hubris of assuming relevance enduringly. Now, why am I being such a buzzkill for you on that subject? Well, it's because of this question. So maybe you could take a couple of minutes with the person next to you and just ask this candid story from the perspective of you as the good stewards of our alumni association. Is relevance an issue for us or for you today? Take a few minutes and then we'll talk about it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's reconvene if we could. The reason I want you to think about this question, which is not intended to be um, critical, it's simply intended to engage you with something that, as a good steward, you would probably want to think about anyway, and that is relevance. You see, I'm, a gra I'm an alum whether I'm active or not, which is an interesting idea. But for you, is relevance uh, an issue? And I just wonder, does anybody have any thoughts on that? And I hope this will help get some of the conversations going during your time this weekend. Who'd like to start? Yes, sir. I think it's definitely an issue. I mean, you, I think in this room, we've got a segment of the population that are hardcore means people, you know, it doesn't matter what the alumni association or branch is we're doing, these people will be involved. But how do we challenge this question for folks that maybe Queens was one step in a, in a longer education process, maybe they're coming to your city where your branch is just as a short landing pattern, maybe they just have no interest in getting involved. And how do we, in, in, I guess, engage in that question of how do we remain relevant, and then before that, who are we trying to be relevant to? Okay. And I think that that's something that, I mean, in my experience, we struggle with. We've raised a ton of really good things. I mean, it's, it's the who and why. So um, there's another, I don't have it here, but there's another, um, another thing I teach people, um, teach is the wrong, it sounds like I'm doing the work. There's another suggestion I give to people. It's about how to think of strategy and competing. And it always begins with this, this question, without fail. What is the problem that a customer hires your product or service to solve? What is the problem that a customer hires a product or service to solve. We, we don't often think of it. We ask questions like, well, why does someone buy? Why does someone join? But if you frame it as problem, you start to realize that it's much more fertile. Right? So I kind of see where you're coming from in a way. OK, good, thank you. Relevance, anybody want to pick up on this idea? What do you see? Yes, please. Uh, well, it's definitely a new branch network. I think major concerns. Or it is of relevance to us because we were the kind of the Facebook before Facebook existed for yeah. alumni in the city once they left Kingston and now that things like Facebook and social media exist, that challenges our relevance as a, as a branch because people are able to stay connected with others. So um, definitely changing and adapting is very relevant. Actually that was the that was very to me was it was stunningly good. I actually felt a chill run out my spine when you said that because I was thinking, do you want to compete against Facebook these days? 
answer no. But if you think about it, that's exactly correct. Back in the day, I needed the alum association in part to connect with people. Now I don't. Wow. So the question then is, if it's just connection, you may have a Kodak moment. What else is coming up for anybody? Back to your point for retention. Yes, please. Uh, that you've got to, if you're going to uh, uh, connect to people, you've got to be paying attention. Okay. So somehow we've got, we're coming back to the idea of attention at the core. It's the attention you folks give to it. Maybe how can you inspire that in others, and how can you give attention to what people need that they're not getting from Facebook? I'm kind of, is, how many people here are on Facebook? Just a quick survey. I figured uh, more than 100% of the room. That figures. I am kind of on it, but I'm getting disinterested. It's just I'm fed up seeing everybody's baby pictures or their cat or, you know, I just, I'm losing it on that. And I'm kind of thinking I want, to go, I'm, I want to go back to the good old days where you hung out. I know that sounds a little creepy, but I just, I just am getting tired of all of this happy Facebook stuff when you realize that's not the real world. There's something not there. There's something not there. It will never be there. But the problem is, if, that, if, if a person who's a grad says, I don't know, Facebook's pretty good, that's where they are. How do you move them from there? How do we find a way you have to bring your attention to that problem? That's a really interesting idea. Yeah? I like your question, Doug. There's a question that that question sparks in my mind, which is, what is relevance? Yeah. And, you know, I think it's important we ask that question as well. What, is that, what does relevance mean, in other words? Um, and I, you know, I think what Ryan was saying, we were certain, we're certain to buy a sample here, no doubt, uh, in this room. And you know, if I think about my, my, my own personal Queens network, most of them couldn't care less. But they're happy, they're, they're fine with it. They went to Queens, they're proud of that, but that's where they're, you know, I love what you said. Uh, you know, I'm an alum whether I'm active or not. And you know, I remember uh, David Saunders saying to me once, he had a lot of people say, you know, someone, someone called you, me from the lost alumni. I'm not a lost alumni. I know exactly where I am. And I'm like, oh. You know, that's an effort. You know, it's good for us to think about that because, you know, in our thinking, in the way we think about the work we do together, you know, uh, how do we want to be relevant for our online population? What exactly does that mean? You know, and, and it'd be great for us to to know. And I also, the other thought I, we were talking here was, is the answer to that is it a generational response? Is it expectations? Is it you know? And I, I love what you're saying. Is if if we're you know, I mean, and I, I work with Ryan at the branch in Toronto. If um, is there is there a relevance niche that we can provide that it wouldn't be competing because it would be a, a thing that no one, no other uh, problem solver can provide. If we could figure that out, maybe then we'll have our special sauce, yeah. and we won't have a for that moment. What can you do that Facebook can't do? Exactly. And actually, if even if you frame that, is not a bad way to go at this. But one way to compete against Facebook is not compete against Facebook. What's interesting about what you're saying to me is, is um, you were squarely in the place of people who are grads, but there's something going on that needs pushing. And to your question about relevance, I'll tell you the question I would use if someone said, well, what does relevance mean? I always use the zero base one, which is, if it didn't exist, would you invent it? And if the answer is indifference, don't waste time. But the question then has to be, what is the thing that holds it together? What's interesting is that's not just a present day question, that's a future question, which means given our future present moment bias, what do you do to not just make it work now, but make it work 5, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years from now? Trouble is we can't quite get back to, we can't get that in our head if all we're worrying about is now, this month's programming, this year's programming. What else is coming up for anybody uh, on this question? Anybody show you? Yeah. When I think of relevance, I think of the value. I and mean, whatever, whatever that is, uh, you're solving a problem or it's a relationship, that you're receiving more value than the effort and time that you're putting into it. Okay. And value is, 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 is a, it has a disturbingly calculative feel to it, but I kind of know where you're going. It's not quantifiable value, is it? It's something else. Not always. Not always. Okay. It can be quantifiable. Yeah. It could be job related. It could be leadership development. It could be a bunch of those things, but sometimes it's not either. Or it could just be meaning. Um, 
Teresa, when she introduced me, said I was a U of T grad. I was twice. Uh, I'll tell you the only thing I remember from my U of T experience, it's one thing, particularly my undergrad, was my student number, 76130170. And the reason I remember that is that's all I was to them. Now, it's easy to sit here and take a kick against U of T, but I don't want to do that. It's a great institution. But the trouble is, my experience as an undergrad was I was this number. And my point is, and I know we're different, at the same time, you have to wonder if they're trying to get my attention, and I, my memory of it is I was a number, it's really hard to move me. Okay, let me move on. I want to, uh, I've got a few more minutes to go, but I'm, I'm going to, uh, I want to show you one or two things. Actually, I'm going to show, um, just that these are ideas that I just left that came up with me, which is whatever you're encountering, it may not be relevance. Is it simply indifference on the part of others? Are people simply busy? And as you turn your mind to what to do about it because you care, the question that I think you also have to think about is can this be resolved or worked through in the short term alone? And that's where part of, I think, the, the obligation in a constructive way comes of recognizing the short term bias and being able to say, I would choose to let that go because we have to, in this group, ensure A, our own perpetuity and survival, and B, making sure that we are doing the work so that 5, 10, 20 years out, there still is a good alum association. And some of those seeds have to be planted now. Beats me what they are. But my guess is there's some things that have to be done right away. Because part of what you're coping with, I think, and I'm going to just come in with some data from elsewhere, is not just choices of people, but habits. So this is an interesting little book. It's fun to read. Um, the core of the whole book is there, by the way, in three words. But the essence of the argument is to understand habit, you have to understand how it works and how tough it is to undo. And a habit is something that's triggered by a cue, C-U-E. In the case of the author, his habit was having coffee and a cookie at three in the afternoon. The trigger was three in the afternoon. He didn't like the effect cookies were having on him. What did he do? He, well, he bought a cookie, went up to the 15th floor at the New York Times building and hung out with his colleagues. What was he really doing? What was his reward? He was hanging out. It was social. What did he do? He changed the routine from going to get a cookie to bringing carrots. I know it's a small thing. But he was happier as a result. But what he started to understand was the cue was beyond his control. The reward, to some extent, was important to him. All he could change was his routine. Now, in a couple of weeks' time, um, I do not know how many, let's say a couple of thousand people will be wandering across stages somewhere. I don't mean stages on Princess. I mean stages <laughs> at Grant Hall or the Ark, and they will become yours. But what is the habit they have now with you? And the question is, what habit can you build in them that will be tough for them to break. So here's the challenge from the cheap seats. If being an alum is seen as merely another word for a donor, I don't have to be a donor to be on Facebook. You have to ask yourself, beyond money, what is it we want from people who have been through an experience that for many of us was transformative and indeed for many of us is still very powerful? So it's not to say the university doesn't need the money, because we all know that story. What I do think we should say is, if that's all it's about, maybe some of the reaction is understandable. <coughs> so well, here's a question for you. Just thought about this. One of the, my, the most interesting companies in the world is Google. We all know that. Do you know that Google doesn't make any money on almost everything? They only make money on one product, the advertising, AdWords product. Everything else is a money loser. They give it away. Isn't that interesting? They only make money on one thing, but it's a lot. But everything else is given away. Now, in the world I live in, we call that business model. It's how you compete, how they compete. But the point of which is, there's something there which says, what are we giving people beyond nostalgia? And what can we give them so that instead of asking for donations, we're asking them to line up outside because there's so many that want to donate. 
And all I'm wondering about is, it's how we change the routine to something else that allows that relevance to exist in perpetuity. We are definitely not getting to the detailed planning stuff, ladies and gentlemen, because in this world, in your world, there are three horizons you have to plan for or think about. Here they are in vivid gray from now to long term, because truthfully, there's very little you can change in the short term. Realistically, it's not possible. But I want to leave you with this question, and maybe you can take a moment and we can talk about it as we close, and it's this one. Is planning for the long term your responsibility? Is that something you have to or should be doing? In case you're wondering, by the way, what the picture is, it's the 10,000 year clock that the Long Now Foundation created a number of years ago to get us away from worrying about microseconds instead to get us to think about what happens over long periods of time. You can look it up later. Two or three minutes is our obligation to, in effect, plan for the long term. And then we'll talk on that. And then I want to show you one thing, and we're done. So over to you for about two minutes. This is the talk among yourself part of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, folks, let's reconvene if we could. Um, just wanted to give you this very briefly because I do want to be respectful of your time. What's coming up for you is this is something about the long-term part of your responsibility is, or how do you frame it? Because that's actually the, the critical precursor question before you do anything. What comes up for you, if anything? Is this something that's on your plate or not? Yes. I don't really view it as, a, as much a responsibility as in if you don't have a kind of bigger picture view, regardless of how unpredictable or how complex it is, um, you may not figure out your short-term plan to kind of at least okay. move you in that direction. So it's not okay. really a responsibility to me. It's the value of thinking about what you want in the long run. If we don't have a point of view about the long run, we can't get too many good short runs. Yeah. You, you're saying in a way, how do you make the right trade-offs right now. Okay. I like that a lot. I really like that. It's nice. Thank you. What else is coming up for you? Yes, please. Um, we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. You said that thing about um, the planning is the important part, not yep. the action. Prepared minds, absolutely. So um, it is our responsibility to just keep having these conversations and maintain the present to the future, but not necessarily spell out what the plan needs to look like for five, ten years, yeah. but just to make sure we're all engaged in this conversation the whole way through so that it can and one of the most critical things might be to make sure that there's always going to be people having it. Right. So there's, that there's more people involved in the conversation mm -hmm. in case some of you have other things to do in five or ten years. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah? Uh, so I'd say yes, it is our responsibility, but mostly to build a foundation for, like, we are one generation of this now, but for the next generation and the next executive, because the, what we do now will have an exponential effect in 50 years. It almost makes me wonder if, if, you know, and I think back to Kodak, that if the people who ran it, let's say, 10 years ago, had made different choices of who followed them, maybe things would be different today. And you have to wonder whether one of the other little things that went on there was making sure that there was so much deference to the past that they were indifferent to what was happening around them. But again, I don't want to sound like I know the story. It, it just strikes me that something doesn't go wrong in a big organization unless it's systemic and everybody's agreeing not to see it. What else is coming up, if anything, for anybody? Unless I don't want to gain, I don't want to cut into whatever other time. Yes, please. Well, we were talking about that it is our responsibility, but like you just mentioned with Kodak, we can't assume that the long term is our present. Right? We can't make a long-term plan assuming that in 20 years things are still going to look the same. Like Ryan was saying, too, we're all of a generation. What the next generation takes the QUA to is going to be completely different. I mean, education, we're trying to prepare kids for jobs that haven't been invented yet. How the hell do you do that? Right? So, yeah, you have to think long-term, but you have to think long-term in that we don't even know what it is yet. And it's really open to that. It's interesting. I have the same problem as an educator, so we share that. And the, uh, the only struggle I have is how do I get the undergraduates to see learning as a useful skill? And, and not learning what I'm teaching, it's learning to learn so that they don't need me, as weird as that sounds. So I, I, I get it. I totally get it. 
the, the, the difficulty is what do you do if they don't see themselves in your place? That's the hard one. Yes, please. I think we take it for granted that there will always be an alumni association. So I think we, need, we do need to learn to plan long term so that we do continue to exist because there's nobody there supporting. If we can't stay relevant, uh, then it will die out at least you know, branch by branch. And that's how much the lose its fizzle. So we kind of have to remember that there is always a risk that maybe uh, we might not be there like Kodak. Okay. So in other words, it's back to the need to keep shall we say, working on this garden such that there are always going to be others who are suitable. Okay. Anybody else? Let's take one more. Yes, please. And for me, I think it's, it's more important to have new ideas coming in, whether it's with new people or just people with different angles of seeing what the future is. <coughs> they potentially maybe Kodak. <coughs> The same group of people having the right mi same mindset, thinking of the same problem or same future, and potentially they didn't see that there might be something else out there. Okay. So just bring new people. Okay, thank you. Let, let me do this. I want to close because uh, I again want to be respectful of your time, so I've gone a little bit over, and I'll apologize. Uh, um, you will get all these slides. Everything from about this point on in the slides is the more nuts and bolts of doing planning. It's all very self-explanatory. That said, I also encourage you to be in touch with me if you'd like about how to put it into action, and I'd be happy to continue the conversation. My email address is in there, and, and, and I, I'm really sincere when I say we should keep this conversation going. I say that because of where I started at the beginning, which is what you do is important. And it's important to people who may not notice it unless it ceases to be. And the thing is, not everybody is awake to the fact that Facebook isn't a perfect solution. Not everybody is awake to the fact that someone has to water this garden called our Alumni Association. Uh, it's not that they don't care, it's just that they may not remember because they're busy. Something in you, however, is that like that tomato plant that is fertile and bouncing, and the trick is how do you make more of you? So as an alum, I'm just going to say thank you very much. And as someone who's been here burning an hour and five of your day, I hope this has been useful. If not, I hope it's been useful. Thanks very much. <laughs> Take care.